Thank you. Uh, my name is Sean Spitzer, Senior Instructor for Epic Games. I'm going to walk you through some world building concepts and principles to think about when you are building your stuff for virtual production. And uh, let's go and get started. So uh, one of the first things, and yeah, there's my face again, big and live and on the screen. Uh, let's go ahead and look at theory and practice and overview. Hopefully, I'm not going to lose my voice. <clears throat> it's been a lot of talking and a lot of uh, helping clients and so forth. And so I'm going to hope my voice hangs in there the whole talk. So the things you want to look at and very important to consider when it comes to real time is <clears throat> the power of what Epic Games can bring to your production. A lot of people are using offline renderers and when you use, use offline renderers, you throw a lot of stuff at it like a kitchen sink. But you want to be very deterministic when it comes to working with a real time environment. So virtual production classifications, you can see this up on the screen here. <clears throat> and what we're gonna mainly be talking about, excuse my voice here, let me get a drink of water. We're gonna be looking at setting up a scene for ICV effects and virtual productions. You'll see here some workflow considerations for ICV effects. <clears throat> we have everything from the full scope of scripts, storyboards, all the way down to the final production. And you'll see the difference here, the traditional workflow, and you'll see ICB effects production workflow there at the bottom. The benefits of virtual production, we have a unified asset creation pipeline, programmable, programmable real-time production tool set, and these are the things that Unreal brings to the table. Remote and multi-user uh, capabilities, real-time physics and simulation, reduce rendering requirements, real-time camera tracking, and improve data management and tracking. So again, I'm hoping my voice stays together for the whole thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you'll see the benefits here and the limitations working with real time. And uh, excuse me, for ICV effects. But they're all, like I said in the beginning, there are rule sets that you have to obey when it comes to real time versus offline renders. And I'm gonna show you some of those rule sets and that's pretty much what I'm gonna bring here to the table so you can understand some of the considerations and also how convenient and quick Unreal is when it comes to building your world environment. So let's go ahead and look at world building and optimization. So one of the big things that I said this in the beginning is knowing and being very deterministic as you go in and jump into your scene. You wanna make sure you understand your blocking, your environment, and exactly what your priority areas are. Super important to consider. Now you will see here, there's some concept art here. This is donated by some of my former students, believe it or not, uh, King Chen and Brandon Jones, great guys. But you'll see here that I'm looking at what I need and what I want, and I'm assembling my assets as I get ready to put them in the scene. So priority areas are really, really important. But let's go ahead and look at a quick way in how fast Unreal can get lighting working in your environment. So let's go ahead and go to Unreal. <coughs> So in this particular scene, I'm gonna go and get rid of my directional light. I'll leave my rec light, which is a fill light for my interior. I'm gonna get rid of my skylight. I'm gonna get rid of my volumetric cloud just temporarily in this particular environment. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete these. Get rid of my directional light. So all we have is this fill light in this environment. And we're gonna pretend we're going from scratch. We got a few things maybe in the scene. We really haven't done much. Maybe we worked in unlit mode. But I'm gonna show you how quickly, and let's get rid of our exponential height fog too. Oh yeah, go back to Unreal, I thought you caught that, I'm sorry. I should have been a little more louder, <laughs> my bad. So we have a completely blank scene here, and I'm gonna show you some of the cool tools that we have at our fingertips. One of them is the Environment Light Mixer. We also have the Light Mixer, which allows you to maintain and control and look at your environment and see how your light's being related to all your objects. And again, I apologize for the raspy voice. It's kind of been this way for the last few days. So I'm gonna go in here, go to my environment light mixer. I'm gonna pull that up. In my environment light mixer, I'm now gonna create my skylight. I'm gonna create my atmospheric lights, and then I'm gonna create my volumetric cloud, and then I'm gonna create my um, height fog. Now we're a little bright right now coming in, but we can change some of this as we go. But you can quickly get up and rolling in your scene if I get out of the cave for a moment. 
and you can get ready to build your environment as you need. So let me go control Z real quick and get back our scene that we had before. One of the most important things you want to make sure that you get a hold of is you want to make sure that you go ahead and bring in a post-process volume. And we're using Lumen out of the box. Now, earlier versions of Lumen was a little rough coming in because it was evolving and getting better and better. But you can now use it on your ICUVX volume environment. You do need to keep th some things in consideration, such as your glowing objects, those size of those glowing objects, also your noise with your materials, figure out where your roughness stands and how much you can give and take in that particular area, and then be able to control and maintain how your scene looks considering those aspects. So let's go ahead and create a post-process volume. My bad there, I clicked on the wrong thing. So I'm gonna to go to my uh, tool set here, my quick project add. I'm gonna to go to my volumes and I'm gonna to go to my post-process volume. <clears throat> this post-process volume is gonna be my gateway for quality control. Now we're using Unreal out of the box. So if we go to my project settings, I'm gonna point out a few things. Sorry, my mouse is fighting me a little bit. I'm going to go down to rendering. In my rendering, I'm going to take a look at here. I'm going to see that I'm set to Lumen. And in Lumen, I have my <clears throat> settings set up here so that I'm using surface catch. Now, if I'm using high reflective materials, I might want to set that to hit lighting in real time and then use my post process volume to, to fix some of that detail on the back end. You always want to have virtual shadow maps when you're using Lumen. This allows us to have higher quality shadows and is a lot better than just baking out of the box. That doesn't mean you can't use baking outside of Lumen if your needs are there in that area, but Lumen makes your life a lot easier because you can quickly look at changes in your lighting without having to rebake. So as I scroll down here, you'll notice I am making sure that, let me go ahead, I gotta lean in here with my glasses. I have support hardware ray tracing is on. That's gonna help us with some of the load graphically and make it so it's easier for us to be able to maintain and update our environment quickly. And we're gonna have two places to turn that on. You'll see there's support hardware ray tracing here. And then we also under Lumen use this hardware ray tracing when available. So it can work without it, but it can also speed up things. If you're running to some issues where your GPU may be having a little bit <clears throat> might need a little bit of help and it's ray trace capable. You can actually lean on those. Let me get a drink of water. I am sorry. There we go. It didn't, didn't help much, but we're there. All right, so let's go ahead now. I'm gonna close this out. So my post process volume with that active, I'm now gonna go down to my post process volume and turn on my global illumination for Lumen and on my Lumen Global Illumination settings. Now you wanna start low, you always wanna start low in the very beginning. So our screen detail is gonna help us a lot, as well as our final gather quality. And we have maximum trace distance. But you'll see there's some new things if you've been following Lumen since five <clears throat> that we've included, such as our scene um, capture resolution scale, such as, I should probably go down to this one, advanced. Let's turn these all on real quick. And you'll see these new ones, skylight leaking and full skylight distance. Now these are similar to like our ray tracing features that we had before when you'd have to use a CVAR and have to have an extra push to calculate your skylight information. We actually have those options now to be able to control that. So you can make things a little bit better and a higher quality. So let's go to our skylight for a second. Speaking of, you always wanna make sure you have real-time capture on and that's gonna give you the best results overall. So it should be on by default but if for some reason you're inheriting something from the marketplace, just make sure you double check that and make sure it's on. And the nice thing about Lumen 2, since we're already set up and ready to go, we can go in here now and change our lighting on the fly. And we can link our lighting if we wanted to directly into a level snapshot. So level snapshot will allow us to keep different versions of it and show it to our director immediately. This is really great. Instead of having to stream levels or rebake I can show on the fly my global illumination and the changes within my environment. Pretty nice. Using that with your post process volume, you should be able to get in the right spot when it comes to getting your lighting initially set up. So let's go ahead and go back to the slides. <clears throat> Thank you. 
So here is some um, a CVAR here that you can use. Oh, looks like we lost the signal. Go away. No problem. Here's a CVAR you can use for better shadow quality control. And the benefit of using our virtual shadow maps is it allows you to really get some nice, believable shadows with a nice drop off from where the initial contact of those objects are. And they can see an actual degrade of the shadow like in the real world. And you can control that with some of these CVARs. This is just one of many that I'm showing here, but you could use this to be able to go in the right direction. All right. So here we have uh, use all your tools under your belt. We have a lot for bridge to be able to, to grab and mega scan. So on bridge isn't set up here and I'm not, not necessarily gonna wanna go to there. But in the slide deck, you can see there are some things you need to consider. One, you need to consider what your level of detail is going to be. Are you going to be using nanite? Are you using medium or high quality? You have to consider these things before you get in there. The thing you do want to watch out for, and we get a lot of clients to do this, is they throw everything at Unreal, all the high poly all at one time. You still, even though we're using nanite in here, you'll still want to be deterministic. You want to decide where things are gonna be of higher quality. And in the background, you could even use cards if you needed to. Why not, right? If it fools the audience, they're fine with it. But if you need to move them around, you need to be very deterministic how you're gonna approach that. There are some other tools we also have available that some people aren't aware of. In our marketplace, you'll see there's three different levels here. The dry grass collection under Megascans. We have another one called quarry collections and another one called uh, live, uh, Lava Field Collections. And in there are blueprints that you can use and you can edit and help with your construction. Now we're gonna talk about our procedural uh, content generator in just a bit here. So if we go into my environment here, back to Unreal. You'll notice I actually have some active blueprints in here. This particular one is our random scatter. So I can change these number of meshes if I wanted to, and I can get those in place, one to many. These are some of the blueprints on what they can do for you. Here's another one that has a more of a spline breakdown here. And this one is our uh, quick soul spline scatter. And you can add the meshes after the fact. So you'll see there's several meshes loaded in here. And as I increase the spline or move it around, I'm clicking on the spline here, it's a little hard to see in my screen. One second. There you go. I can move these points around if I need to. And it will change and update and populate my spline curve. So it's like a low level procedural, it's just built into a blueprint that you can add for construction really quickly. And I've added several different pieces in here. And again, back where those slides were at, you saw that there was three levels that you could look at. Now, let's go ahead back to the slides. So we talked about using mega scans. We can also use LODs. Now I'm not gonna get too deep into LODs, but LODs level of detail is very important. The reason why just considering time in this particular case, so I have a lot of nanites in here. So it's kind of an either or situation where I'm working with an LOD or I'm working with nanite. It's really up to you, but it's better if you are, you want to use the three, I call them the, the, holy, the holy trinity when it comes to working with Unreal. You want to work with virtual shadow maps. You want to work with Lumen and you want to work with nanite. They all like each other and they work really well with each other. To be able to convert a uh, simple piece of geometry into an nanite, I'm gonna go and click on one of my rocks in my environment. And I'll just point you in the right direction because a lot of these are already converted. I'm gonna click on my um, magnifying glass in my folder, find it here. And I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna go in here and go to nanite and I can activate nanite through this particular object. Now again, if you're bringing in, importing these objects and you want them to be nanite, <clears throat> in the very beginning, you wanna make sure they're high poly. If they're low poly and you do nanite, it's kind of pointless because the way our nanite works is actually going to call upon those triangles when needed as we move our camera around and the higher fidelity will be visible based on your positioning in the world. So if you didn't wanna turn it off, you do have the option 
say you needed to bake something or you're working in virtual production before you got on set and you needed to test something out, you can also turn off that night and you have the thing called LODs. You see them here at the top. Right now it's doing auto LOD, but if I wanted to, I could click on custom and then choose as many levels of detail that you can do. Now, if you're unfamiliar with LODs, it stands for level of detail. It allows you to change your level of detail based on your camera position. So you're not drawing the highest amount of polys all at one time. It's time for a water break, ladies and gentlemen. One second. But you have that option. All right, so let's go back to the slides. So editing levels. Now there's one thing I wanna mention. <clears throat> Excuse me. I get emotional when I talk about this, I'm just kidding. Um, levels are fantastic, I like using them. And I can't emphasize enough when it comes to virtual production, they're a great way and a great place to be. Now our, um, our persistent world, our large world uh, system that we have, that we're working with right now, um, I believe the name just slipped my brain for a second here. But I, I gotta say, I recommend using levels when possible. We have, oh, world partition, that's it. So world partition right now is still evolving and it's more game centric. And it, you may run into a little bit of hiccups when it comes to perforce and world partition. So you wanna try to focus if you're in virtual production, at least right now, you wanna focus on using levels. Now you'll see in our environment here, let me get out of this uh, particular fellow. We have levels. I have my geometry in one level, except for that guy, he's extra. He showed up later, what a jerk. And then I also have an NDC, which is our visual to be able to go to the wall, which Kevin did yesterday. So let me go back to my bookmark because I'm completely lost in my world there. Go back there. There's a bookmark. And I'm inside the cave. There we go. The other bookmark, Sean. Has it in pause? There we go, zero. Yeah, hey, that's exactly where I want to be. All right, so <clears throat> we're working with a persistent level. And yet, any time you can make a level and add those items to your, uh, to your environment, we can create a new one if we need to. And we can also organize our folders in here as needed. And we, again, as you saw, I can turn them off or even log them so that other people won't be messing with my particular stuff. Maybe I really like plants. I don't want nobody messing with my plants. I can lock those down. Engine scalability is also gonna be huge when working with your scenes. Keep in mind what your hardware you're pushing and your, uh, what your GPU can, uh, where its max or limit might be. But you can actually, if you run into some issues, also dumb down visuals here. And we've moved the settings over here for engine scalability off here to the right. And you can see that I can keep it an epic or cinematic, depending on your needs as you, as you go through your workflow. All right, let's go back to the slides. So we talked about how you can add to your level. You can create a new one with the geometry in place. So those are the little bit of breakdown of what I just mentioned. You can also have it always uh, in your level if you need to. And if for some reason you need to make a blueprint for some, uh, I don't know what you would, I can't think of anything offhand. Most of the time I make it always loaded because then I can sort everything and put everything in the right position. So let's take a look at our PCGs, our procedural generated content here. Our procedural generated, uh, I minimize that, my bad. Our, um, Procedural content generator. <clears throat> so I have one in place right now. Let's go and click on that. And let me show you how this works. So this procedural generated content allows me to go in here. And as I move things around, it will shift and move based on the geometry that I've loaded. It's actually a lot easier to work with than most people know. Put it back. So let's go and take a look at that up close. So we have our PCG sample. We'll go to our PCG folder. And let's go and open up that sample. So this procedural generated content 
allows me to go in here and I'm gonna hit control to get a little bit closer on screen so you can see it. I'm using a surface sampler. And if I open this up, you'll see that I'm using landscape. I'm using my transform points to make sure that it's calculating how this is working and relating to the surface. And it's also looking at the difference here. Now, if you need to, you can bring in self pruning so you don't have it actually overlapping on each other and breaking some of your scene. And you can see that I have under my medium trees, I have transform points, self pruning, and then I'm loading my geo on the back end. And I can choose whatever geometry I want. So here I have some large rocks. If we go up here and look at our meshes, our entries here, you can see there's several in here. And as I move my procedural content around, it will shift. And you can see a demo of it over here also. If I click on this particular one, I will move it around and you'll see it shift. Now I've gone a little too far under one area. Where'd he go? Let me do control Z. They decided to go bye-bye. I don't know why. So we'll just, think, let's look over here real quick. <laughs> so you can also add a blueprint in here so that your blueprint is related with a player tag. It'll actually update and shift my plants and remove them. If you look really good, I'm using like the smallest plants in the world. You'll move it here. You'll see that move out of the way. So I make it a path so I can make a path in a forest. Unfortunately, this forest has gone through several fires. So um, you'll see that I can now shift it and they will move and go related to my area. Now, the reason why that's set up that way, this one's a bit different. This one is set up with a spline curve instead of related to terrain. I'm not really sure why these disappeared, but they decided to, that's fine. That's not normal. Um, only when you do demos live, that's when that happens, ladies and gentlemen. So this spline curve here is my spline sample. And in here, I'm not gonna go into this one too much. I can get into the weeds way too fast, but there's a player tag in here that I'm using that I can actually relate to my setup into my environment. And you'll notice there's really nothing special overall in here. It's just using it as a reference point. Let's go ahead and close this out. And if we look at our spline sample here, you'll see that this is getting spline data getting my spline sampler, transforming my points, looking at their difference, and then also there is some of the geometry I'm working with. All right. Cool, that's just a quick sample one. I think there's one more probably I could show you. No, he's old, he's old school. All right, cool. So let's go back to the slides. So to be able to turn that on in Unreal, let me go back one slide here. You want to make sure that you turn it on within your plugins to get your uh, PCGs up and running. And then in your content browser, you will see a now a subject you can choose called PCG. And I give a little bit of a rundown here. If you want to take a picture of this on your phone, you're more than welcome to. There you go. Just a quick overview. Don't want to get too much in the weeds there. Watching my time. Doing pretty good so far, actually. So self-pruning, like I said before, you can use that to prevent your geometry from getting on top of each other. And it's really important to consider that. Also setting things to binary in my difference node, my density function. So let's go and take a look at some of the modeling options you have. Now I'll, do, I'll, I'll work briefly on these because our modeling tools are still evolving, but they're a lot more powerful than when they first started. And they allow you to actually change some things quickly. So I'm gonna pick on this little rock for a second. I'm gonna hit the F key. This is gonna be our little guinea pig. Um, this reminds me though, I do wanna mention some, uh, a, a little aspect here. You have to keep in mind with working with Lumen. You kinda wanna, with Lumen, you wanna try to have full solid objects if you can. Now you can have back faces like this, but you do got to be careful or open back faces. You do got to be careful if you're starting to push them into each other and just monitor and make sure that you look for any shadows that might be a little dark or some light leaking that might happen. 
Un um, Unreal and Lumen really like it if you're building things kind of like Legos in pieces. So you'll notice my cave over here. Let me hit the F key here. My cave really is just a hodgepodge of things on top of each other. And Lumen likes that. It works a little bit better. And you can prevent maybe some weird shadows or material sorting uh, issues with your light in shadow maps. So it works pretty well. Now, if you're starting to build a whole room and you weld everything together, don't do that. You'll see that in our documentation. Lumen no likey. It does not like that. And you can run into some issues with that with your shadows and your output. So you got to be careful with that. All right. This one, I mentioned that really quickly here. So let's go ahead and pick on this piece of geometry here for a second. And I'm going to introduce you to some of the cool aspects of the modeling tools, which allow you to be able to actually edit things pretty quickly. There is one thing I do want to mention when messing with the modeling tools. If you're deciding to do some sculpting, be prepared to adjust your UVs. Now, the sculpting tools are still evolving, but you also have the ability to remesh and simplify a piece of geometry. So if I decided to simplify this geometry and I find that he's too high, you know, you can do that. Now, Nanite does an amazing job. I showed you how to turn on Nanite. And uh, we don't have time to go through the debugging of Nanite, but there's also a debugging tool. But you can actually simplify or even remesh to get a higher poly count for your objects. I do want to mention, if you are going to mess with modeling tools in your project settings, make sure that you go in here. I'm going to type in modeling for a second and make sure that ray trace is on enable ray tracing for your new mesh object and also for any of your modeling aspects. So if you, let me, let me try this here, ray tracing. There's a particular switch I wanna look at, click on here. You miss object ray tracing, let me see here. Support ray tracing shadows. Da, 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 da. And I think we're good. I think we're good. So we should be okay. So, all right, cool, cool, cool. Awesome. So in the older versions of using 5.1, this is something to consider turning on your ray tracing for modeling tools. It looks like it doesn't quite need it for this particular one. I thought maybe it did. That's just me being old. So over here, you can see we have this object here and say you want to change the pivot. Now you brought it in wrong. Like you brought, this happens all the time. We have people learning Unreal, they brought in the asset, and they're like, ah, oh, crap, I have to re-import it. And the old school way to be able to change the pivot, you would go here and say set pivot, reset pivot, not very helpful. But our pivot tools here are really awesome. Now, I got to say, when you're using this pivot tool, quickly you can change it. You can choose whether you want the bottom, the center, the top, and then you can hit apply. But you got to make sure that it is an individual object. So if he's in this scene 20 times and you change the pivot, our the way that we have our instancing, it's gonna look at each and every single one and shift that pivot. So you wanna make that object unique. So find that object, and then you can just drag a new one by duplicating it. You can just duplicate it, then drag it back into your scene, and then you can use some of those aspects for that to be able to fix that and get that place in your world really quickly. Again, the modeling tools are fantastic. The UV tools are still evolving, so just be cautious when you decide to sculpt, and you're gonna to need to go in here and you need to do some editing after the fact. All right, let's go back to the slides. So there's uh, the samples I was just talking about when it talks about adjusting the pivots and working with those items. Model editing, some notes here. Duplicate your model, which you heard me say earlier. Very important because if you decide to sculpt on one model, all the instances will get that sculpting. So you want to do it individually and isolate that object. So stage monitor, stage monitor is your best friend. I'm not sure I have it on in this particular case, but I'm gonna point you in the right direction. Stage monitor, there it is on. I should know because it's on. We set it up with ICB effects. Stage monitor is gonna allow you to actually see your processes and how things are going on in your scene. Now stage monitor also allows you to see if there's any hiccups as things are being built and being brought into the scene. So just be aware of that as you're working through your stuff. I spelled sage instead of stage. So you see a stage monitor right here. And it tells you critical source name, 
it actually allows you to be able to save it, the data if you need it. Hey, I'm noticing one of my render machines are giving me some trouble. I'm gonna save that information and analyze that later on. So it's actually pretty helpful. Let's go back to the slides. So profiling overview. So looking at your profiling here, you wanna be able to actually look at your scenes and be, be very deterministic on how your frame rate is going. Now we can initially, when you're working and building your scene, you wanna take a really large, a really good scope look at your environment and understand that when you go to the stage, your end display is gonna hammer some of your frames because you're going from your scene your render and you're going to your cameras using end display. So you wanna have the highest amount of frames that you can ahead of time. Now initially, we can go in here and just show my frame rate and see what my stats are for my frames per second. You can also, did that show up? I think it did on top of the green tree there for a second. We can also go in here and go to our output log this is my favorite friend of all time. I'm gonna show you a few more tips and tricks in here too. We're gonna to do stat GPU. And we can actually analyze things initially in here to see how things are going. Now, there's, a, there's several different ways to tackle this. There's also profile GPU. I'm gonna show you insights also as well as session front end. So I can go in here and say, let's do profile, um, profile GPU. Now, the way that profile GPU works, it takes a snapshot of where your camera's at. So you might wanna bookmark things, and it's a quick and dirty, cheap way to be able to see your priority areas and where your milliseconds are being hung up. I'm like, man, my fog is killing me. I need to go in there and put some fog cards instead of actual fog. So you can actually analyze where your hiccups might be. So another one we also have is Session Front End. Now he's been around for a while. I actually like Session Front End a lot. It actually works really well. But you can also use Unreal Insights, which gives you a better and deeper dive into things. So let's go and pull up our Session Front End. So I got my session front end here, clicking. And the interface, if you've used this before, has changed a little bit than what it was in the past. So we had a lot of icons before. We don't really have them as much anymore. I'm gonna deselect for, uh, for a second and reselect my scene. I'm gonna go to my profile here, and I'm gonna go data capture. So it's gonna capture data on my scene. And as soon as I, you know, I can move my camera around, getting closer, and then I can stop that data capture and say, would you like to transfer the data capture to your scene here and take a look at it? I'm gonna say yes. I wasn't in there very long, so it should be able to do it pretty decently. Try that again. There it goes. It's gonna give me a file. I'm gonna say load the file. And now it's gonna give me a breakdown of where in milliseconds things may have given me some trouble. So I can go in here and say, oh, you know what? Let me look at my media. Let me look at my, I don't have any media stuff in here, really. I'll go to my Nanite. Let's look at Nanite. Let's get a healthy dose of where things are going. So how is my dynamic data instancing doing? Any custom data information I got going on? What are my Nanite proxy instancing, instance memory? How's that doing? And it's gonna give me a readout and tell me in milliseconds how that's being processed and will give me a spike where those issues might be. And this gives you a CPU and a GPU breakdown of things. And it's a kind of a lighter version. You can think of it as Insights kind of light. We've had it for a while, but Insights is kind of the more heavier handed or the more robust way to look at things. And you can find Insights now down at the bottom here where it says Trace. I'm gonna open this up. And we're gonna go ahead and open up our Unreal Insights session browser. Now the nice thing about Insights, it's kind of a standalone, almost like an EXE. So you don't have to worry about if you're getting extra data as if you're in the editor at the same time. So it actually works really nice, really lean and really clean.
We can go in here and go to connection. We can say connect. Not sure if he's gonna connect today. I didn't uh, set up the system, so I'm kind of winging this one. Should be good. And then we now open a trace and it's starting to trace our environment live. Pretty awesome. And it gives you kind of the same roundabout data that we looked at for session front end, but a little bit more robust. And again, it gives you CPU and it also gives you GPU breakdowns for your scenes, which is really great. You'll see the CPU here and also the GPU. And you can hunt down where you think you may be running into some issues. I can wheel mouse in and see, oh, my milliseconds for my fog is giving me some major trouble. So I, maybe I need to swap that out. Maybe I need to now keep that a bit lighter, dumb down the settings, remove some of the lights in that area. All that stuff can be set up and ready to go. Now, if you want to stop your trace, I'm going to go output log. I'm going to stop trace. And we should be great. Cool. All right. I'm like way ahead of schedule. <laughs> so let me go back to the slides here. So there's are some additional resources we have for you getting started and some documentation. I want to take a picture of those. And I am actually like 20 minutes, I guess, above my time. So we can do a little Q&A if anybody has any questions, I guess. Anything else you might want me to show, but I am way out of schedule. Hey, uh, yeah, so I had a question. Is it possible to, say, record a, Sorry, like a sequence of a, of a camera shot and then analyze that sequence in Insights as well to see where you have sort of some, some trouble points? So are you talking about like you're recording it and then you're going to look at the, the data in Sequencer? Like, y yeah, like yeah. Almost it, using Insights with Sequencer? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I usually, I do it through, do it real time. I think there's a possibility to do that. Okay. Our Insights actually is pretty robust where you have, we have Insights for animation. We have Insights, but the animation side is a little bit, I think, um, separate from Sequencer, but I'm not sure I can get back to you on that. You okay. can email me. Not a problem. So it's Sean.Spitzer at Epic Games. Copy that. All right. No Thank problem. You. One thing you might try is uh, seeing if you can add the data that you want to Take Recorder and then hit Take Recorder at the same time. And that'll record it into Sequencer. So you might have to build a blueprint that allows you to access that data. Um, but for the most part, it should be possible.